Hi, my name is Jerry. I'm a twin troller, boat owner, and a lifelong fisherman. Some of you may know that I have replaced my normal lead acid battery on my boat with a lithium battery. And the one that I used was a Battleborn lithium battery. And those are expensive and you need to change your battery charger that goes along with that, even more expense. However, I have no regrets. It works great, much better than a lead acid battery. Well, I got a hold of a, another twin troller boat owner. He clearly has a bunch of skills that I only wish I had. His name's Patrick. He's from central New Jersey, and he built from scratch his own lithium battery. I didn't even know that you could do that. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know where to get the parts, but he does, and he's going to explain that to you. Now, this is a technically advanced procedure, but some of you may get something out of this. You may even decide to do it yourself. Maybe if I was looking for a lithium battery and I hadn't bought mine, I might have tried this. But let's see what he has to say. Now in the video, he did some other changes to his boat. I'll go over those a little bit with you and then we'll go over the building of the battery. And below this video, I will put links to a couple of places that he said he bought his parts from and some other uh, links of information about the products that he used. So let's learn something new today. Below this video, click on show more to see links for many of the items used in most of my videos. They are there so that you can locate them in case you are interested. These are Patrick's own words. I purchased my twin troller in early spring and was hoping to have it ready by summer, but that didn't happen. I do 90% of my fishing at night, so I need lights. The navigation and stern lights are mounted on the boat via some 3D printed parts that I designed. The stern light mounts to the rail that the seats go on. One of my objectives is rigging without having to drill new holes into my boat. I used holes that were already drilled for the original battery charger and the fish finder. The stern light shaft is just a PVC pipe painted black and can be folded back down the side and secured by a clip. I used a solder on automotive LED bulb for the stern light. The bulb cover is 3D printed using a translucent filament. I installed a fuse box with light switches in the location where the original charger was mounted. I built a 150 amp battery using 24 Navitas, if I said that correctly, cells purchased from Battery Hookup in Pennsylvania. The cells cost $313, including shipping. I wanted to pack as much wattage as possible into the battery box. These cells are just the right size. I decided not to install a BMS so I had to add charging leads for balanced charging. I used the iCharger S6 with a 24 volt DIY power supply for charging. I also installed a battery monitor that tells me exactly how much power is left on the battery when I'm in the water. Patrick, when you see this video, please answer below. I have a question about your battery monitor. It was my understanding that all we could do would be to test for voltage on the battery and that that isn't a very accurate way to predict the amount of power still left in the battery. But your battery monitor gives actual percentages of the charge in the battery. Could you explain that a little and explain where you got that and how it works? Regarding Battery Hookup, which is the company where he got his products from. They're popular with DIY power wall community and other interested persons in making their own battery packs. They sell both recycled and new batteries, depending on what inventory they happen to have at a given time. I've had good luck with them in the past. They're generally very accurate in describing what they sell, but you have to read very carefully. You pay for what you get. The Navitas or Navitas, however way you say that, the Navitas batteries I used were new but no longer in stock at Battery Hookup, but they're currently selling an identical battery with a top brand label. I will put a link that Patrick gave me to where he gets his products below this video under show more. So directly under this video, you should be able to see those links. 
The building process is actually not at all that difficult and there's good related information on the internet. But you do have to be very careful. There's a lot of energy in these types of batteries. Accidentally dropping anything metal, such as a socket or screwdriver, into the battery terminals may create a short that can make the metal glow red within seconds and potentially set fire to something nearby. When I was connecting terminals, I covered the non-affected terminals with tape to stave off potential mishaps. I covered all the terminals with Kapton tape, that's K-A-P-T-O-N, Kapton tape on the final build for that same reason. Having gotten that out of the way, let me try to summarize what I did. First, let me give you some general background information. There are many types of lithium batteries, with three being the most common. There are lithium ion, L-I-L-O, and examples of LILO batteries are 18650 cells used in laptop computers. Lithium polymer, LIPO, and the examples of LiPo batteries are the pouch cells used in radio control vehicles like model airplanes or radio control cars. And there's also the lithium ion phosphate, also known as LIFPO4, which is the most natural fit for building a 12 volt battery. That is the type of cells used in my DIY battery and in your Battleborn battery. LifePo and LiLo cells have a nominal charge and maximum charge of 3.7 volts and 4.2 volts respectively. Given this, it's difficult to combine these types of cells in serial to get around 12 volts. Now, serial is not the kind that you put milk on in the morning for breakfast. That's a method of connecting electrical circuits. LIFEPO4 cells have a nominal voltage of 3.2 volt and a maximum charge voltage of 3.6 volts. So combining four in serial, you get 12.8 volts nominal. Among the three, LIFEPO4 has the highest number of recharge cycles, thousands versus hundreds, and is also the safest chemistry. Unlike LiPo, there's very little risk of fire or explosion with LifePo 4. The one disadvantage is the larger size and heavier weight, and for the twin trawler, we want the LifePo 4. Now, as a side note, my Battleborn battery weighs about 30 pounds. It replaced a lead acid battery, which actually had less capability in it that was close to 70 pounds. So that's a considerable weight difference between the two batteries. I selected the cells I used based on size, capacity, discharge rate, and ease of building it. I wanted as few cells to connect as possible and as large capacity as possible. As long as everything fits into the battery box with room for either a BMS or battery monitor, and we'll talk more about the BMS and the battery monitor later. Next is capacity and discharge rate. You'll need the cells spec sheet for this, which is on the screen right now. For reference, I've attached the spec sheet for the Navitas slash top band cells that I used. When connecting cells in serial, you add voltage. When connecting in parallel, you add capacity and discharge rate. Voltage remains unchanged. Each Navitas cell has the capacity of 25 amp hours. So to make a 25 amp hour 12 volt battery with a 1C discharge and 3C maximum discharge, and note, discharge rates are given in amps or C ratings. Amps is obvious, but C ratings create an unnecessary confusion in my opinion. You connect four cells in serial. To make a 150 amp hour 3.2 volt battery that can discharge at 6C. For my battery, I made four groups of six cells connected in parallel and then connected the four parallel groups in serial, which gave me a 4S6P 150 amp hour, which is six times 25 amp hour 6C battery with a nominal voltage of 12.8 volts or four times 3.2 volts. 
According to Freedom Electric, the twin troller motors require 30 amps each at full throttle. My battery can discharge at 6C, which is 150 amps, which is way more than adequate for the twin troller. I used a flattened one half inch copper pipe for both connections. You can also use wires or pre-made bus bars if you have a source for those. Just make sure that the serial connections are large enough gauge to handle the current. Current between parallel connection cells are comparatively much smaller. Next is battery monitoring. Two things that can degrade the useful life of lithium batteries are overcharging and over discharging. Note, charging in freezing weather also destroys lithium batteries, but that's probably not too relevant with the twin troller. Theoretically, I can recharge my battery with a dumb charger that outputs around 12.4 volts, which is four by 3.6 volts, but that will probably result in overcharging one or more of the cells because the cells may not be balanced initially. Here's an example for the 4S1P battery made from the Navitas cells. Suppose my four cells are 2.7 volt, 2.7 volt, 2.8 volt, and 2.6 volt before they're charged. And therefore, they're unbalanced because the four voltages are not the same. If I charge with a dumb charger that outputs around 14.4 volts, I'll just pump current into my battery and it won't stop until the battery voltage is around 14.4 volts. What can happen is that the 2.85 volt cell can actually exceed 3.6 volts while the battery voltage is still under 14.4 volts. The dumb charger will just continue to overcharge that particular cell in an attempt to reach a pack voltage of 14.4 volts. A balance charger like the I charger S6 I use or a battery management system or also known as the BMS prevents overcharging. A BMS also safeguards against over discharging. Some like the Battleborn also guards against low temperature discharging and maybe also other stuff. The BMS shuts off the battery when it's appropriate. With my battery, the discharge safeguard is me with help from the battery monitor. Note, if I recall correctly, the Battleborn BMS is not configurable. And if that's the case, if the Battleborn is discharged below the threshold set by the manufacturer, the embedded BMS will just shut off the discharge current, leaving your boat with no power to get back to shore. Let me make a comment here. There's another twin troller owner with a YouTube channel by the name of Rick, I-N-S-C, and you should check out his channel. He ran his Battleborn battery down for days until his battery finally died all at once. But that's never happened to me, even after an entire hard fishing day with my 100 amp hour battery. And Patrick has built a 150 amp hour battery. So his is even more than my battery is, but I've never had that issue and I charge it every time I come in because you can charge a lithium battery thousands of times as opposed to a lead acid battery, which is what I had previously, that only allows you to charge it a couple of hundred. There are smart BMSs with Bluetooth connections that allow the user to tweak the charge parameters. On one of those, you can at least tweak the cutoff voltage slightly lower just to get you back to shore. I suppose what he's talking about here is if your battery died, but it still has power inside of it, you could use your Bluetooth and literally turn the battery back on just to get home. That's if you felt that you need that. Regards, Patrick. Probably not many of you are gonna try building your own battery, but some of you may. So Patrick gave us a lot of information and may give you the confidence to try to do this on your own. And as I said earlier, there are links below that he supplied to me that I will put in the show more just underneath this video that will get you to where he buys his products and where he got feedback about uh, doing this kind of work. Now, if I were to do that myself, there's two things I concluded out of this. One is I have a 100 amp hour battery right now and that's plenty. So I would be saving some money on the items that I'm buying because I wouldn't need to do 150 amps like he did. Again, he uses his boat at night 
I never do that. Too many things try to eat you here in Central Florida, out on the water, in the dark. So I don't go night fishing at all. But he does, and he's comfortable doing that. I'm okay with that. He needs the extra battery power for all the lights that he uses for night fishing, and I don't. So to me, 100 amp hours is more than plenty. But I would also, if I was building one, add a BMS. I don't have the technical expertise to do some of the charging issues that he talked about, where the BMS battery monitoring system keeps you <laughs> doing the right thing with your battery. It allows you to charge it correctly, it allows you to discharge it correctly, and it keeps you from charging it if it's frozen outside. Now, I don't know how many of us are gonna be ice fishing with it, but you gotta really dig a big hole to launch the boat, get it in the ice, so I don't do that. So if you have questions of Patrick, post them below in the comments below the video. Hopefully Patrick will see those and answer them so we can all see what he has to say. So I hope you learned from something from this. Thank you for following me on my YouTube channel, Lunker Fishing. We'll see you next time. Bye now.